Hello, and welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum. My name is Peter Weinstock, and I am the Anesthesia Chair in Pediatric Simulation and Executive Director of the Simulator Program here at Boston Children's Hospital. Today, we are very honored to have with us a friend and colleague, Dr. Vinay Natkarni. Dr. Natkarni is Founding Director of the Center for Simulation, Advanced Education and Innovation at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is known worldwide as a leader in the development of critical care and resuscitation science. Dr. Natkarni, welcome. Thank you, Peter. It's great to have you here. It's really good to be here. So I want to get disruptive um, as we think about training into the future. Um, and I know you've done so much work uh, related specifically to critical care training uh, and training particularly of fellows. Um, so I'd love to talk a little bit about that experience that you've had, um, a little bit of the impetus for why you built it and your team has built it um, around the boot camp concept, and then really rapidly get into some conversation about you know, why boot camps and what do they provide, both obviously and maybe even less obviously, um, and what that learning curve has been like for you, and then, and then sort of talk about the, the future of training, or at least wax about it a little bit, um, yeah. and see what we can learn together. I hope that sounds okay. That sounds really good, um, and I think it really resonates because as I think about you know, sort of thinking back to when we started in, with simulation and trying to figure out how to use simulation-based education to train, to orient, to bring people together, to reflect, which I think is the real purpose of, mm -hmm. of uh, all that we do, um, I think at that point, at that stage, I was thinking about it like the American Heart Association courses, like our basic life support, advanced life support, that the content of what we were treating, the skills, some of the behaviors, some of the teamwork was what we learned in those courses. Mm -hmm. And that we sort of went to the course, we got our education, we left the course, and then we were in the real world. Mm -hmm. And I think the transition that has occurred in my mind, after sort of doing this and transitioning from courses to boot camps to just-in-time, just-in-place training, has been the realization that there's stuff under the surface that's beneficial and that it's not exactly the content of what we're teaching and learning, but it's really the process of applying a thought process and then having a safe reflection on what we did well, what we didn't do so well, what we could improve on, and then shopping around to see how, if other people have had similar experiences. Mm. And that's what brought us, I think, that's what brought us and my team at CHOP the, um, to the boot camp concept mm. of bringing different uh, program directors, fellows in training, young faculty together to start with the end in mind, how do I really take great care of a kid when I'm early on in the process? And then how do I build on building blocks of skills, behaviors, attitudes, process to actually come out with the result I want? Hmm. So it sounds almost like there was almost two phases to your thinking. There was the initial phase, which was very much about, um, you know, how do I learn this skill? Uh, the clinical skill. Maybe it's a, a procedural component. But what you're really highlighting also is what became clearer over time is that there was another skill, and that was a safe reflective practice. And how do you use boot camps and how do you use these environments um, to train in both in some ways, um, and with both being so tremendously valuable? So I wonder if you can talk to, to those concepts and take us back to start with just the initial boot camp concept and what that looked like. What you say is correct, that we all come to critical care to do the right things and to learn how to do the things right. Mm. And we're really preoccupied in the beginning that there's a right way to do things and that somebody must know it. And all we have to do is get that formula and practice it, practice it, practice it, and we can do it. And that's kind of what gets us in the door. That's what brought the programs together. That's what, when we invited them to come to CHOP that first year, 14 years ago, it was to say, you know, we're all in our own individual programs trying to accelerate the learning curve, 
to get the right protocols done at the right time to the right patient to have the best outcomes. So all we need to do is a PALS kind of thing. We need to just practice, practice, practice. But we can do it in ad hoc teams and we can start to do it where we take the individual skills, which simulation is really good at training. We can mentor individually, but we can add a layer onto it of kind of a peer mentoring. So if we bring people together who have a common purpose mm -hmm. and they kind of think they know what they want to learn, they're very anxious and ready to learn it, to be tutored, mentored, and discuss it. Mm. And that got everybody in the room. So we brought 24 first-year fellows from six different programs and their program directors together voluntarily. And we spent a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, trying to replay and rehearse the top 10 case scenarios that they were going to face in their first month of critical care fellowship. Everybody loved it. But what we realized was that the, the way people learned was transitioning. We were coming from a culture of see one, do one, teach one, which was quite acceptable at the time. And work hours were being shortened. And the opportunity, the, the, the number of people that needed to be trained and the number of procedures and uh, resuscitations to be done were small. And the attitude of the public and the administration, the pressure was not to have somebody learn on my child, but to actually be an expert before they could actually work on my child. The supervision, the billing, all of the different aspects were coming together to say, we needed to be able to replicate this. And in fact, that's where simulation really accelerated. But we had to figure out a way to make it safe, to make it safe to learn. So we had the basic assumption that every trainee was intelligent, well-trained, cares about doing the right thing for the patient, and that we needed a forum where we could experience the emotions that come along with training and caring for kids and creating mindful reflection that was psychologically safe both for the real patients and for the simulated patients. And what we figured was that we needed a boot camp. And where does a boot camp come from? It comes kind of from the military, an enforced intensive orientation that brings people to a level playing field that teaches psychomotor skills, that teaches cognitive skills, that enculturates the participants. And it's participatory, they have to participate, and it's immersive. It's all encompassing. They all live together, they work together, they eat together. And in that environment, what emerges is becoming one of the family. And so that's really where it started. So let, let me interrupt you there. Yeah. So I'm gonna push you a little bit on this. When I hear boot camp and I hear the military, the first thing that comes to mind is not, say, is not emotional safety. <laughs> it's not psychological it's safety per se. But clearly they achieved that, and, and you had that as one of your goals and a real target for what, what you thought was going to make this a successful endeavor. What did you feel were the elements that, and still are the elements, or the elements that you now focus on and accentuate to create that emotionally safe environment that seems so pivotal to making these effective? Well, I think part of what uh, creates that atmosphere is, one, the fellows that attend the camp have their program director there with them. Mm. That's kind of their safety net. That's their, their sergeant. Mm -hmm. That's their person who's out there to protect them and support them. Mm. Second is by joining a larger group, they're not at their home institution. They don't have to make an impression. They're not joining their family. They are a little bit anonymous. Mm. They can try things that they've never tried before because they're with people that they're not gonna be working with every day. Mm. And this aspect of it creates an anonymity that allows them to experiment, to explore, to try on new things, to be a person and do things in a way that they've never tried before and allow them to make mistakes. But what we do is we preface it by modeling that. So when they come to the boot camp, the first case scenario they see is the attendings attempting to 
deal with a very complex case mm. and see them struggle a bit and see them discuss the struggles and how it reminds them of the real patients that they struggled with, the vulnerability. And that lesson is repeated over and over again that each one of the individual fellows, attendings, young attendings, old attendings, we all feel like there's been a mistake. Like, we don't really belong here. We're not, you know, like everybody else is smarter. Everybody else knows everything, et cetera. But by sort of the experiencing how each one of us, including the faculty, is vulnerable and has these self-doubts, that's probably one of the most important lessons that we share. We'd like to take a moment to turn to you, the audience, and ask a couple of questions. Uh, when responding, please leave your city and country location. The first question is, what do you believe to be the most valuable aspect of attending a boot camp? How would you measure the impact of attending a boot camp? So it sounds like you looked at it in, so you've been building it with both of these perspectives in mind. Um, how did you initially develop the needs assessment or what did you find from the initial needs assessments in terms of trying to fill out content when you just got started and how has that needs assessment or how has that content changed over time? So we, we started out by just sending out a simple survey and asking the fellows that were going to attend before they arrived, what it is they expected, what it is they wanted? And they very consistently, year after year, want to practice code leadership and the algorithms for resuscitation. They want a, practical tips on how to do procedures, very concerned about their ability to intubate or put a central line in. They want to improve their airway skills. They want to improve their leadership skills. They want to meet fellows from other programs, and they want to sample the variety of approaches from different institutions. But mostly, they're concerned with managing those routine things like shock and traumatic brain injury and respiratory failure that they're now going to be faced with from a different perspective. But what they, what they don't realize, I think, is that there are things that are prescribed and perceived needs and expressed needs. But perhaps the most important thing are those things that they don't know that they need to know. Mm. We've actually facilitated this a little bit by um, creating a safe mechanism for them to ask questions and get them answered. We take little post-it notes, and during the between the sessions, between the case scenarios, they can anonymously put up any question they want. I really love that. I, it, um, I love the fact that you have a needs assessment. That's your traditional kind of, you sent out a survey and whatnot. But very uh, part and parcel of the, the way you've always developed simulation in this just-in-time, just-in-place right. way, you've even done that with the needs assessment. <laughs> so in the boot camp, it's sounding like there's an in situ um, ongoing needs assessment that goes on through these post-its. So they're continuously asking questions, look, trying to elicit more information in a safe, psychologically yeah. safe way, and then the, the answers can be provided on and a Peter, basis. And Peter, I think that's really, really cool. important because what one set of fellows, one set of trainees might mm -hmm. be really important to or really engaged in or really worried about is not necessarily what the next group is. Mm -hmm. It's been an evolution. And to maintain that interest, it's actually got to grab them, right? right. It's got to be important to them. And so um, we do want to have a structure and we do have objectives. So we want to make sure to cover some basic objectives uh, in there. But we also want that flexibility mm -hmm. to adjust the whole boot camp to address the issues that are hot. And that's similar to simulation, right? There, We have objectives when we do our debriefings. We want to cover this and that. Mm -hmm. But we do want to let bubble up mm. what is important to the trainee at the time, as long as it doesn't derail the entire process or destroy it. Well, it makes me think of you know Malcolm Knowles um, and these principles of adult learning, and one being that they're very problem-focused, yes. very internally driven, yes. and problem-centered. So that post-it concept really appeals to that part of the adult learner yeah. uh, in a very concrete way. I'm curious. Um, you know, I'm thinking of adult learning, and I'm thinking about your boot camps. I would imagine the boot camp can sometimes be perceived as, you know, you think about the experiential um, experimenter. Um, did you guys look at that at all in terms of, 
is the boot camp amenable to the various learners out there? And, and how, did you, how did you approach that to make sure you were capturing them? So, Peter, I think that's exactly right. You know, Kolb identified really an experiential learning cycle, and that involved a con people who learn very concretely, a concrete experience. And then they like to observe and reflect on that. And then um, as you go around that cycle, abstract concepts pop out. And then from there, there's a test of change. People who like to test and push on that and see if those abstract principles, and that gets you back to reinforcing that concrete principle. So there's generally, as you know, four types of learners, according to Cole. Those that diverge, those that take the concrete experience and they observe and reflect. And then the assimilators who take those observations and reflections and they form an abstract concept. And then those that converge, they take an abstract concept and they converge to test whether that's in fact true for them. And then those that accommodate, they take those tests of change and they convert it into a rule or a concrete experience. So what we did was we we looked at the different times and we, and we did a survey, called survey, which identified different attendees of the boot camp and mapped them out. And what do you think it was? It was pretty much a quarter in each quadrant that there were all types of learners. And when we, our biggest fear was that maybe we were helping some of them, those that learn experientially right, right. or like tests of change and are bold and out there. Uh, but we also found that there really was very little difference in their subjective appreciation of the boot camp, what they got out of it. Whether they were in one or the other type of learner, it was pretty much across the board they felt they got what they needed out of it. And with that, we've been able to um, feel better mm that the approach, using the building blocks, getting into simple cases, then complex cases, adding emotional factors, and this discussion process has been successful in building their confidence and their competence. But what we haven't been able to yet really study is whether it parlays out into their real process of care and the patient outcome. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of the holy grail. We want to grow them, we want to nurture, we want to be able to, we want everybody, and we know that everybody has the capability of making it. So we sort of start with a discovery, with a novice learner, and we know that they're rule driven and they don't have a lot of capacity to manage complexity in general. Mm -hmm. And so we start with the nuts and bolts, the simple skills of bag mass ventilation, intubation, recognition of respiratory failure, little uninterrupted, focused, peer and mentor guided training, bits and pieces. And then as the camp progresses, we put those skills into action with simple case scenarios, undistracted, clear roles defined, till we get to sort of the pattern recognition and the deliberate management of the complexity of the medical aspects of the case. And then we build to the very complex cases with the distractors and the family calls and the other patients and the, the stress level of perhaps an argument or a pushback. And in that case, there's sort of the decision making that needs to become intuitive, where the management of the complexity has to be adaptive and where the knowledge has to be more comprehensive. And so we build those skills until we get to the point where they can self-identify that they're overloaded and they need to discuss the elements that are coming on. And what we found is that what comes out of that then is a confidence in the basic skills and an acknowledgement both from the trainee but also a reinforcement from the faculty that there are always going to be situations turns, setbacks, switchbacks that were unexpected. And that the real learning is how to be adaptive. The real learning is how to handle the situations when you're at the limit of your knowledge or your or your capacity and how to how to 
leverage the resources that you need mm -hmm. because the resources are generally in or around the room that you're at. So I'm curious, what have you measured uh, in response to some of these boot camps and how have you looked at that or how are you planning to look at that um, in terms of some of the outcomes of these efforts? So we've really um, scratched the surface, I would mm -hmm. say, of doing an, an elegant, you know, evidence-based kind of approach. We've started with simple things like surveys before and after, measuring perceived, self-perceived confidence, competence, teamwork ability, um, and um, effectiveness, and receive high scores on Likert scales, time after time in each aspect of the skill training, the behaviors, teamwork, high scores. Mm -hmm. We then resurveyed the fellows after one month and six months after the boot camp mm -hmm. to ask them what the value of the boot camp, their perceived value of the boot camp is in each of those areas, confidence, competence, et cetera, and again, receive high marks, less so in the vascular access, central line placement, because I think by one in six sure. months, they've yeah. caught up. Sure. They don't feel as if it was necessary, they would have gotten it. Sure. Same thing in delivering bad news. They really appreciate it immediately after the boot camp, but down the road, six months later, they feel like they caught up. But what they identify as the real value is this ability to be a leader and a follower and the learning curve of how to deal with the unexpected. Mm. And that was kind of a surprise for us, that that was not what got them in the room. If we had advertised the boot camp to train these skills, I don't think we would have gotten any of the groups to come. But the fact that they thought they were gonna train on the 10 most common algorithms they were gonna use, but what they really appreciated they got out of it was this adaptability, this understanding, this lifelong learning mm -hmm. of how to approach a patient helped them. It's interesting. It, it, it really relates to this uh, you know, curriculum and hidden curriculum yeah. concept that we've yeah. talked about a lot. Um, and what in particular, the one that strikes me, and I know that the fellows had always um, re that resonated with them from when we've spoken, is this whole issue about leadership and followership. Yes. And I'm curious, um, how did you explore that? Um, what were some of the techniques that you guys use in the boot camp to sort of explore that in a pure sense? Well, about year five, mm. um, we were having real trouble because so many of the trainees are alpha. Right. They are leaders, and they came to the camp feeling like they wanted to learn how to lead. Mm. And uh, it was very hard to get the concept that being a great follower, being a great team player, was equally important mm. as being at the foot of the bed, calling out the commands, etc. So we sort of stumbled upon blindfolding the team leader. And so, and this has subsequently been published and actually a technique mm. to improve leadership and followership. So we put a blindfold on the team leader. We had a case scenario that was quite complex that needed intubation, central line placement, medications, defibrillation. And they're running the code. And they're running the code right. blindfolded, and all of the team members are given the one instruction that they cannot do anything to the patient unless it goes through the team leader. And it forced them to sort of understand and discuss the, what helped the team perform. How could this team leader, who, by the way, performed marvelously time after time, they actually frequently do better blindfolded mm -hmm. than with eyes open because they don't get engaged, they don't get fixated on doing the things themselves. They actually rely on the team and the team actually figures out how to speak one at a time, how to report the key elements of what they're seeing that needs to be fixed, how to make suggestions to the team leader without actually taking over and doing things without the team leader knowing it. And that sort of symphony, that kind of, that kind of interaction when when it happens, it's like a melody. It actually, they recognize that that is the goal. And they, it's, it's really a realization. And by going through that process, we now use it in every boot camp. Um, and it's remarkable how well they can run a code. And the other question I, I think that's interesting about faculty is, um, 
it almost speaks to there's a whole set of learning objectives specifically for the attending faculty uh, to the boot camp. And I'm curious if you can touch on that as well. What, what are the current learning objectives and where could you see this go from the standpoint of, of what the faculty get out of being in the boot camp specifically? Well, some of the things um, are really uh, concrete. So in other words, in order to run the boot camp, because it's now gotten very large, now it's uh, uh, in the U.S., it's 130 fellows, um, and it's uh, more than 34 programs and more than 80 faculty. And we have to actually split it up at CHOP and at Washington University, St. Louis, and Stanford in order to have the facilities to run it. Um, but the faculty get together for a half day before we start with the fellows. And we're rehearsing the scenarios, and we're talking about, hey, do you guys use the video laryngoscope? How do you use it? Do you use it as a direct laryngoscope? Do you use it for coaching? Mm. Um, should we be teaching ultrasound? Do you guys teach ultrasound of the subclavian, the internal jugular, the uh, femoral? It's really a discussion that goes back and forth, even to the point of, you know, how do you interview your fellows? Um, how do you run your your recruitment package, et cetera? But then um, when we actually free up the faculty, they actually go and observe how they're facilitating each of the aspects of the course. So you get a little free time. That's That process is one that we build on to sort of figure out the differences and the variances in the programs. Mm. We have panels during the boot camp, in fact, we will take a tricky case, let's say a traumatic brain injury, um, who has a neck collar on and uh, signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. And we will have a panel of the faculty in the front of the room. Uh, and we will ask at random one of the fellow participants to call them with a circumstance and to ask them a question. And by seeing that variety, the variety of choices, but the similarity of thought process, I think it really reinforces part of the value of both being a participant, mm. but it also stimulates conversation amongst the faculty. And that's the satisfaction facu uh, factor. That's the satisfaction factor that comes out of the faculty coming to the boot camp. We'd like to turn to the audience now and ask a question. When responding, please leave your city and country location. How would you rank the following non-technical boot camp competencies in terms of importance to your trainees? Vulnerability, adaptability, social networking, recognizing limitations, self-care, and any others you'd like to include. All right, so now I have to ask you a hard question, sort of a more difficult question, which is what, what has been the most difficult part um, of building a boot camp? And another way to phrase that would be for someone who's thinking about mm building a boot camp in their subspecialty, what would be your either word of warning or your advice um, about building one of these out? I know that they're, they're spreading among, among specialties now. Uh, I'm seeing boot camps popping up all over. Yeah. There are a few red flags, I think. One is concentrating too much on the technology because running a boot camp means that you have to have a lot of simultaneous mm -hmm. things going on. So the physical layout and thoughtfully... Um, some practical issues of like doing the things that are clean first and the things that are bloody or, you know, going to create a lot of mess later on. Mixing and matching, uh, thinking about how people tend to click up. They tend to stay in their group if a group of fellows comes from a given program. So figuring out how to, for some parts of the boot camp, spread out and distribute across the program so that they're not with people they know and work with every day, mm. but then to allow them to come back enough so that they feel like they're able to practice and implement things amongst the people that they're, their family, if you will. Mm. We always worry about embarrassment, about putting people on the spot, performance anxiety, uh, and trying to be knowledgeable and to keep alert for signs that somebody may be getting pushed beyond their limit. Mm. And then we have frequently, I think in every boot camp, we have had to use the backup system of making sure that each fellow has a faculty member that's kind of their timeout, 
because oftentimes something outside of the boot camp is happening that yeah. requires your attention. A family member sick, uh, a child at home that needs their attention, et cetera. And they need that pop-off valve to be able to, to do that. So those are mm. things that we we really worry about. And You know, it strikes me that there is, as you assemble uh, these groups, you know, the group of fellows, but you're also assembling a group of faculty, um, they're coming together to manage this event, which is to teach this boot camp. Uh, so I'm curious if you guys have thought about or how do you, pre do you prepare faculty as they come in uh, to teach and how do you unify the mental model? Um, because you're, you're, you're coming together in an ad hoc way at a sort of meta level. That's a good to, point. To teach this, this boot camp. How do, you, yeah. how do you think about that? How do you organize it? Now that we've been doing it for 14 years, it's a lot easier right. because we kind of have a regimen and we kind of have a status quo, which gets changed a little bit, modified, but we're not starting from square one. Mm -hmm. In the early days, what we did was we had a series of teleconferences leading up to the boot camp. Mm -hmm. We distributed, so we distributed the case scenarios in advance. And then we would discuss how we were going to, what the key objectives were for each case on the teleconference, and then what methodology we were going to mm -hmm. use to debrief it. So what we're going to use kind of a plus delta, what went wrong, what went well, uh, sort of correcting kind of methodology, or were we going to use more of an advocacy inquiry, be curious about what was going on, and then discuss what came out of that and how what we observed and how that could be modified. Um, we sort of came up with a hybrid, and then that's what we used that morning before the boot camp. We actually practice and discuss okay. amongst the faculty that are actually going to be in the room real time when they're really focused on it. Interesting. Right before we start the boot camp. So, so at this point in its career, this boot camp, it's sort of you've codified pretty much, An approach, and yes. but the way you got there was sort of through iterative yes. huddles, essentially. Exactly. Or faculty development we continue, huddles. We continue those huddles now. So at lunchtime mm -hmm. and in the evenings, within we do the course. within the course we do a debrief. We do a whole group debrief, about 15, 20 minutes where we ask the participants what went well, what could be improved, et cetera. But then we stay after another half hour mm. and the faculty have an individual debrief about what went on and if we want to make any modifications for the next day. Mm. And so that little debrief at the end of the day and the feedback changed the way we do it. We don't do it every right. scenario, right. but it really yeah. improved kind of the, the, uh, the feeling the feeling of confidence and competence, and the actual competence and competence, because we were repeating yeah. it. It wasn't quite deliberate practice. It wasn't right. really doing it to ex excellence and expertise, but it was a step along the way. Then I want to sort of um, sort of close up by talking about a bit about the future. How do we optimize engagement of the adult learner? And then I also want to talk about how do we refine our approach to training? So Yorks Dodson in 1904, I think came up with this inverted bell shape, right? Which is how do you engage learners or how do you get them activated? Well, there's this activation axis and then there's this learning axis. And it turns out that if you overactivate them, then they learn less. If you underactivate them, they're asleep and they learn very little. But there's this sweet spot on the yorks dodson model. Well, I think you're right on. I think, um, so clearly the learners coming into a boot camp or starting their critical care careers are engaged. They've volunteered for this. This is what their life's work is going to be, and they want to be there. But I think a lot of times they're motivated by the skill mm. and, and really focused on not essentially what they, what they need, right, what they want, but not essentially what they need. So um, there's this sort of fall off of disappointment but then it can be re-engaged. And Todd Chang at Children's Hospital of LA, I think, has done a really great job mm. of adapting gaming, of, of creating leaderboards, of engaging competition, of sort of drawing on these the competitive spirit to re-engage or to reinforce simple training behaviors. And really, Todd has even you know created games where using CPR quality, you can post your score and challenge another unit. Um, Ricardo Lubrano in Italy has taken this one step further. He challenged all of the residency programs in Italy, 32 of them, to create six-person teams at their own institutions. 
and they rotated a set of mannequins around from institution to institution during the year with the objectives of the 12 PAL scenarios to become expert at running those. And then once a year, he brings them to a small community outside of Rome to a high school and has a simulation Olympic Games, a sim wars, if you will, where they compete in a fun kind of way and discuss and debrief about the cases and challenge each other in a competition. Next year, the winner is gonna go to Mexico City to the WIFPIX conference and compete in the 2020 games, Olympic games, like a sim wars. But these kinds of things I see in the future is becoming more like the X games, that, that as technology gets better and better, as the complexity of our patients and our care gets more and more, we're gonna to have to use more elegant tools. Now, you and I have both played around with and experimented with some of the tools like eye tracking technology, like Hexoskin wearables or watches that are wearable that track your heart rate variability and spit cortisol and, and sort of assessments of the physiologic features of stress and activation that you were talking about. These types of tools are here and now we're using them in our real delivery rooms to look at the eye tracking of, of the code leader. Are they looking at the baby or the monitor? What sequence do they look at the heart rate and the respiratory rate and the blood pressure and the saturation and the baby's heart and the baby's face? And by looking at how experts use these and look back and forth between these tools and how the novice does, we can start to learn the patterns that transition and accelerate the learning curve from novice to intermediate to expert. That's how I see the future. I don't know. What about you? You know, it's interesting. I, I think um, what this conversation has really prompted in me to answer your question is really the value of this hidden curriculum, is really this transferable um, curriculum that's less um, specific to critical care per se, but is transformable across subspecialties across medicine, which really has to do with, as you've described and I, it really has to do with how do you create rehearsal opportunities for safe inquiry or for self-reflection. Um, so you people feel comfortable having an internal dialogue about, am I making the right decision, the wrong decision? Perhaps I've made the wrong decision and how can I correct it? How do I face my failures? Um, that, that's coming, it, it, it seems to really be embedded in your, it's really made me think, it's come, really been embedded within your boot camps. So Vinay, as you know, and I know at CHOP and at Boston Children's, you know, as it, we're in the season right now, um, as the new fellows are arriving and everyone's engaging in orientation programs. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about distinguishing um, uh, orientation programs locally from these, from regional boot camps and sort of the uh, pros and cons of both and how they, um, and the pros and cons of both. Yeah, and I, this really comes up because there's so many efforts locally to orient and train to how we do it. How, how do we do it at this institution? You're new to our institution or you're new to this position, and I want to orient the new trainee to how we manage asthma or how we do this locally in a very specific way, my way, our way, right? Um, but some of the challenges with that are that there's a lot of, local responsibility. That person is maybe in the clinical schedule, they have family obligations, they've just moved to the new city. Um, and they're they're trying to work with and establish themselves, establish their identity within their new family, within to identify how they will perform. And so in some ways that's a little bit more intimidating than going to a large boot camp where you can be anonymous, where you can spread your wings, where you can try things and be the person you have not been before. You're not trying to impress, you're trying to learn. You're simply one of the crowd. And that advantage um, helps you to learn not the way to do something, but exposes you to a way to do something. If you would have asked me what we were gonna talk about today when I knew the topic was gonna to be boot camps, I would have thought we would be talking about clinical content. And we'd be talking about central lines and how do you learn ultrasound at the bedside. But we've talked about a lot more than that. We've talked a lot about social networks. We've talked about relationship building. Um, we talked about psychological safety, emotion. Um, 
We've talked about a lot of humanity <laughs> related to strengthening trainees uh, to do what they need to do. Um, and, and in some ways, that's in tension a little bit to the scalability of what you've described, right? So now you're talking about um, International Olympics and gamification, and it begs the question of virtual reality, um, mm -hmm. scalable platforms. So I wonder if you could speak to this, this tension a little bit between um, digital platforms um, and, and this need for this humanistic connection or this, you, in, you described this idea of modeling, that the, the faculty model failure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do we reconcile this? How do we scale, but at the same time maintain what seems to be at a very important part of this curriculum, which is this hidden curriculum of, of humanity and emotionality? Right. You always ask tough questions. It's a it's a great question, and I, I think some of it is is embedded in that the social interactions now are evolving and different. Ten years ago, I would have said you absolutely have to be face to face. You have to see, feel, taste, talk to, mm -hmm. experience this real time, right there with the person, live. But our interactions have gotten much different. We're now used to virtual reality. We're used to teleconferences, video teleconferences. We're, we're really used to communicating in a way that feels real and is a real connection, but is not necessarily physical and proximate. Mm -hmm. So I think in the future, it's gonna be quite possible. We've demonstrated and studied actually how to use telemedicine and telesupport from CHOP to Tokyo and Tokyo to CHOP. The technology makes it possible and the co-facilitation from numerous uh, groups has been successful. But what is unifying is the connection. It's not the electronic or the proximity, it's can you relate? And I'm not sure that anymore that requires face-to-face. -face. So I think telemedicine, telesupport, the virtual reality fields avatars are going to be able to connect mm. in a way that we've never connected before. I think it's possible. It's amazing, Vinay. Well, I, I, I want to thank you uh, for being here, for coming to visit us again. And um, I, always, I always learn a ton uh, when we're together. And thank you for continuing to disrupt uh, <laughs> training and education in critical care to, to, to really save lives. Well, thank you. So, I really enjoyed it. It's just been wonderful. Thanks again.